In your Bibles, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, beginning in verse 23, we're going to talk about the hope of uh, resurrection. At, at first, the phone was ringing, and I normally, and not, not because I don't, I don't do it, but I normally don't answer the phone because I never get the chance. Pastor Steve or Pastor Jeff, they, they jump and they answer it right away. But So I just answer it, and there she is, this Gloria. Pastor Bird, how are you doing? I'm doing great. By the way, I asked her to share these things with you, and, uh, and she said, yeah, please. And so she sounded just great, like having a good day, and she told me that that was now in heaven with the Lord and all of that. And, and she says, I, I don't know, it's just weird. I have so much peace, and I, I, just, I know where he's at. And, you know, I, I don't know. I just don't know how to deal with this, but I just rejoice for my dad that he's in heaven, and and I was just finishing the title of the message. I have finished my notes and all of that. I finished the title to the message, The Hope of Resurrection. And, and I'm like, what, a, what an amazing thing this is, the hope of the resurrection. We're going to see here in chapter 22, beginning in verse 23. Now remember, just to give you a little bit of background here in the text, remember that these are a series of questions that um, the religious leaders are going to come up with, all of them with the intention of uh, just getting Jesus to compromise on some of these things so they can, one, they can put him in a confrontation with the people, or two, they can put him in a confrontation with the Roman authorities because they believe that he's going to say something that is going to upset one or the other. Well, that's not, that's not going to happen because their questions, they come and they ask these things, but they, they ask things that for them is impossible to answer, obviously. And so they come with that attitude. They said there is no answer to this question, so we're just going to trap them in something, and we'll see. But I want to just give you a few minutes of the background of this attitude. When, you, when we have these questions here, remember that one question we, we touched on last time, it was about the issue of paying taxes. Do we pay taxes, yes or no? And so they want to uh, get them to say something that, again, put them against the people, put it against the Romans. Now they're coming up with another question, and this is more wicked than the first one, because this one has to do with the resurrection. The, what makes this question a wicked question in this case is because it comes from a group of people who doesn't even believe in the resurrection, which will be the Sadducees. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and there are two other groups, but they are not really mentioned in this thing, so I'm just going to stick to these two, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And these, these two, they are... Uh, the opposite of one and the other, uh, completely different. Though in this case, they come together with the intention of getting Jesus into something. Now, in the previous chapters here, we know that they have already plotted together how they can kill Jesus. Ever since chapter 12, when Jesus says, this is what it is, and they said, nope, we're not going to believe in you because you're actually working and doing these miracles under the power of Satan. And that's the final thing. And, and then from there on, the confrontation is it, heated and it's a mountain and it's, and it's uh, uh, getting uh, um, worse and worse. But the thing is here, they are coming together with the Pharisees in, in their intention to get rid of Jesus. Why did they want to get rid of Jesus? Well, we're going to see here the attitude of the heart when men, in the wickedness of his heart, decides to reject the truth. That's exactly what's going on here. Whenever you find someone that is teaching whatever, whatever it is they are teaching, and it is a false teaching, obviously, in this case, but whenever you find a group of per people or, or an individual who is teaching something that is going to cause the destruction of those who are learning from this person or this group or this church or this entity, whatever it will be, if the end result of what they're teaching is destruction and devastation, you don't find any, anybody more evil than that. And that's what we have here in these verses. And we are going to see why this confrontation comes to this place. Begin reading in chapter 22, verse 23. <coughs> it says this. Uh, the same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were with us seven brothers. I don't really believe that this is true. They are just making it up. 
This is a very hypothetical uh, thing that they are bringing, but they make it sound as if it's a real thing. They were with the seven brothers. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, led his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the women died also. Notice the question, therefore, in verse 28, therefore in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her, the resurrection. They don't believe in the resurrection. Of the two groups, the Sadducees only believe in the, five, in the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, you know, those five, the, five, the first five. They don't believe in nothing else. They don't believe in the book of Psalms. They don't believe in nothing else outside of those books. And they always, con I mean, they, they always challenged the Pharisees and said, prove to me that in the teachings of Moses, in the writings of Moses, there is even the mention of resurrection. Obviously, the Pharisees, they couldn't come up with it. And so they, they come up with some verses, and the Sadducees just refute that, and they said, nope. That's not talking about the resurrection. So they are mocking constantly the, the, the Pharisees. They are making fun of them, and, and they just despise them. They don't, they don't like them. On top of that, they don't believe in angels. Again, they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe life after <clears throat> death. They don't believe in any of those things. They said life is here and now. God doesn't really care what you do with, the, with your life here, because once you die, that's it. That's the end of it. There is no soul after that. There is nothing. You die. That's the end of the story for you. So what really matters is life here. They are the materialists of, of, of that group of people. You know that. Like the progressives nowadays. And, 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 so, <clears throat> and so that's all they care. That's all, that's all they can see. The Pharisees, they are more given to the study of the scriptures. And they interpret the Old Testament to be the word of God. Obviously, they, are, they have become masters at uh, making their own interpretation of the scriptures. So where the Bible says this, they said, well, but if you do this. And so they always find a way how to get around the truth that is written in the word. And so you can see they are at, 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 at this, in this con constant conflict in between them. But here's the group of Sadducees that they, they will come and they're going to question. Now, what we're seeing here, again is what happens when man, in his arrogance, takes the truth, which is the truth of the Word of God, and tries to, instead of the truth of the Word of God, come up with his own truth. And what you have is a society like what we have now. And, and the reason I want to take a couple of minutes on this is because, see, what you're going to see here, not only that there is so much unbelief, but that there is an agenda and these guys, whether it be the Pharisees or the Sadducees, they have an agenda. What is their agenda? Well, in the case of the Sadducees, they are definitely uh, inclined to keeping the Romans in power. Because the Romans, to some extent, they have allowed them to do this. Now, by the way, the Sadducees are the ones with the money. Out of the group of the Sadducees, the high priest will come. So they control all of that. When Jesus has this confrontation in the temple with those that are making money, selling and buying and all these things in the temple, it is the Sadducees who are behind this. The, the two high priests at the times, in, in the times when Jesus dealt with them, they came out of the Sadducees. They are the ones with the money. They are more political than religious. They don't care about what the Bible says. All they care is keep the control of the Romans intact. Don't mess with the Romans because obviously the Romans will favor them because there is all this corruption going on. The Pharisees on the other side, they are more concerned about what the Bible says, but with their own interpretation. Remember that Jesus will confront them in the Gospel of Mark and he says, this is the word of God, and I'm just paraphrasing, but you, he says, you have given more authority to your own interpretation and the traditions of men to the actual word of God. So what they are doing here, the Sadducees, because they have an agreement with the Pharisees to get Jesus to do something here <laughs> and to say something that is going to compromise him so they can kill him. Luke in, Luke in his gospel will tell us that. But what we see here is, is something that we still see today. And what it is is the, the, the wickedness of men trying to do away with the word of God so that they can then replace the truth of the word of God with their own philosophy, with their, with their own agenda. These questions have nothing to do with nothing in the Bible, with nothing of a spiritual value for them. 
All they have to do is how they can get rid of Jesus. And so what Jesus is going to do here, he's going to teach us not only how to deal with these situations, but also he wants us to be smart and to look in the background of all of these things. Because just as Jesus dealt with these issues in those days, so we are dealing with those things. In our country today, if, if, you, don't, you, if you didn't know that, in our country today, daily there are attempts to, to pass some legislation of some type in order that they will punish those who disagree with their agenda. And, I, and I'm telling you this, and I'm taking my time with these things, because the last thing we want to do is to enjoy life and to be happy and think that this is kind of like a Disneyland type of movie, where everybody's happy and everlasting and all that kind of stuff. That's, there is no such a thing. The world that we live in is becoming more and more antagonistic and right underneath the surface, there is something brewing that is very um, dark and evil and all of that. Because what they want to do is they, number one, they are pushing everything they can so they can get rid of the First Amendment. Because the freedom that we have is contrary to their agenda. And that's the one thing they are going to keep fighting. And they're going to keep on pushing this thing. It is dangerous to their agenda. Why? Because we speak the truth. Or we should speak the truth anyway. And they want to get rid of any kind of opposition. And they want to shut us down. And they are doing everything they can. They are even promoting some type of agenda that, that they are threatening with imprisonment of those who don't comply with their agenda. So we need to think about, uh, before we get into how Jesus deals with these people, how we're going to deal with the people that we're dealing with right now. Uh, where does, what is this uh, conflict? What, what is this uh, kind of anger and resentment and hostility? What it, it all generates against us? Why is it that we find ourselves dealing with these issues now? Because just as Jesus is going to deal with them and is going to deal not with what they say, he's going to deal with the attitude of their hearts. And that's what we need to understand in the day and age that we live in. You know, it says, uh, and, and I will just read it to you. You don't have to go there. But it says, <clears throat> and you're familiar with this. Listen to this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. But since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men. And then the consequence of that is going to say, therefore God also gave them to uncleanness. And so what we are seeing today is exactly what Jesus wants us to learn from this passage, I believe. This passage is here not because of the confrontation that Jesus has with them, but I believe the Holy Spirit will want us to be smart on how to identify not just the present issue, but what is behind it. What is brewing underneath this whole wicked agenda? And how are we going to deal with that? Because the basic orientation of the human mind, the fallen, corrupted, dark, sinful mind, is opposition to the truth. And we're going to see that more and more and more. Jesus says, I am the truth. And then he prays and he says, sanctify them by your truth, your words truth. And what, what people are doing in their, in their wicked mind, in, in the depths of the dark, wicked mind, is this agenda to, not only to suppress the truth of God, but also to get rid of it. Not just to reject it, but to completely get rid of it. What had happened in our country is, is, is devastating if you go back 20 years from now. And, and, and all these things that they have been pushing for a long time that are all inclined to a licentious type of living. And that's all because of someone in government gives them the power. See, never before in our society we have seen so much wickedness with the approval of our government taking place. We, know, we knew for a long time 
And we knew that these people have been working in the shadows of, 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 of sin and, uh, and, and under the darkness of sin, suppressing the truth. But they are now have come out of the shadows, from under the shadows, and they are more and more open. And they have formed a huge network of wickedness in our nation, worldwide, I will say. And they, are, they have now learned that as they advance their agenda, they know that there is a certain political power that is behind them. And as this political power, which is within their agenda, is being consolidating things that give them the freedom to act in such a wicked form and in, 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 in behavior. As our Supreme Court and, and, and all this state legislation has been passed uh, year after year in, in their attempt to legitimize sin and sinful behavior. And they are gaining so much power and so much control and so much territory that we are now the minority. We don't have field, home field advantage anymore. We're the visiting team. And the problem is that they are becoming more and more outspoken in their agendas. The LGBTQ, whatever name they have, notice what they have done now to, for us to retrieve. And not only they came out of the closet, but now they wanted to stuff all of us in the closet. And I'm saying this is because The reality is here. Uh, us, we've been going to church for, I don't know, years. And we used to talk in, in, in future tense about these issues. There's going to be a day. There's going to be a day. But the day is here. The day is here. I'm not making homosexuality to be the super sin in all of this. There's a whole, I mean, a huge list of sins. But what I'm trying to do is I want us to have an understanding of how they are coming to legitimize their agendas and, and the stuff that is coming about. And all, this, the, all, all of this has to do with a, a, an open attack against the truth. You are the truth. We are the truth. And they hate us. They are not about to negotiate with us. They want to get rid of us. And that's exactly what we see here. Because what, what's going to happen then? And, and, and just go back a few years, and you can see this. <laughs> they, they, for the longest, they have been trying to, to, to say, you know what? If we can just remove God from being the main character in everyday life, there's going to be a void in there. And who's going to take that place? They have. Man in his wickedness removes God from everyday life and he puts himself in that vacuum. What gives them the, 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 the authority to redefine marriage? The power they have. Just look at our government and just, I mean, torture yourself a little bit listening to what the the the, the foolishness they talk about. This lady from Minnesota, I believe, Ilhan Omar, I think is, is, is her last name. If there's one thing the Muslims hate is homosexuals. Why is she body bodies with everybody else when, they, when it comes to approving all these things? And you, that, that tells you that, and I'm just giving you, my, my point here, what I'm, trying, what I'm trying to give you is if, if we are not smart and if we're not committed, and, and that's why I thank God for, for the ladies that pray here every Thursday morning and the guys that pray there every Sunday night. I thank God for you, and I thank God for all of you, each, each one of you here, because church, this is not the time when we can just kick back and relax anymore. The, 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 the crisis that we live in, the crisis that we're in, demands that we are really serious Christians committed to the Word of God. Uh, from every angle that you can see it, from every angle that you can see it, globalism, 
Why is it that, that those who, who are pushing this agenda for globalism, why is it that they, that they are so determined to, to have countries without borders? Because it fits their agenda. Now, who determined the borders of the nations? God did. And so there, there it is again, a, a, a direct attack again against the word of God. And, and it has always been like this. And it has always been the same thing over and over and over. And so what is their purpose? It's to get rid of us. And so I want you to see these verses here that we're reading from that perspective. It's not that they are just coming to Jesus and to make ridicule of him and to laugh at him and to say, ha, 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 you don't know the answer. Obviously, they are going to go back with the bleeding nose because, because I mean, they're messing with Jesus. But it's, that's, just, that's just not it. I think that if we have this passage here, so we, can, we can think about, whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute. The, 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 the question seems to be a very legitimate question. It's not. They are trying, they are trying their best to, to just, just come to the point when they say, you know what? So where's the, where's the truth now? They heard Jesus preaching on, on the truth. They, they, obviously, they, they heard him say many, many times about the truth. But that's exactly what we see here. So... Notice what Jesus is going to do. So they bring a hypothetical case. Now, if you want to read more about this, you can read uh, chapter 25 in the book of Deuteronomy. I'm not going to get there. But it was actually a law, a provision of the law that said that if, if, if a young man marries with this girl, obviously, and he dies, and they don't have offspring, they don't have any children, and, and in, order to, to, in order to keep the family inheritance, it has to do all with that, with the inheritance and the, and, and the family name. In order to do that, the, the, this young girl that is now a widow, she is to marry the brother that is the younger brother, counting that he is a single man. This is not a provision for polygamy or any of that stuff. Counting that he's a single man, this girl is then to marry the, the younger brother. And the first son they have is going to take the, the name of the family so that the property then stays within the family. That, that was the whole thing about this. And we have that case in the son of uh, Jacob, Onan, and all those things. So you can, you can read that. Actually, you can read the book of Ruth, and you will have a perfect illustration of what this law was. So it was a law. But this is what they're bringing here. It's a very hypothetical case where they said, oh, seven brothers. I mean, seriously, by the time you get to the third one, you're saying, like, what's wrong with this woman, you know? I mean, seriously. And all seven of them die. <laughs> and then she died. Oh, wow. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Now, here's the point I've been trying to make for all of this time. This is what Jesus answers, verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Now, he is responding. You are mistaken. The word for mistaken here means you're wandering off. <laughs> or in another words, in our everyday language today, it's almost like he's saying, you're spaced out. <laughs> He says, you're, you're so wrong. And here's the thing. The way it is written originally, it says, when he says you're mistaken, what Jesus is saying here is very interesting. He says you're mistaken first because you have already made your decision that you're not going to believe. That's the problem. That's your problem, he says. You already have an agenda. And no matter what you hear as an answer, you're not going to uh, uh, pay attention to what is being said, hmm. you're causing yourself to wonder. You're leading yourself astray from the truth. You're mentally cut loose from reality. That's what he says here. And why is he saying that? What really touched my heart in these things, he says, you're mistaken. And that why? Not knowing the scriptures. I take that not only to be the answer for the Sadducees, I take that to be a warning to the church. If we take this on the other side, and if the church does not make a commitment to know the scriptures, more likely than not, we're going to fall into the same wandering, into the same <laughs> uh, 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 leading ourselves astray from the truth. We're going to be cut loose from reality. And I, 
I'm sorry to say this, church, but the reason why we see so much wickedness is because the church is probably in the same condition, not, not the whole church as per se, but because the church in general is in the same condition with the world. Ever since the church started inviting the world and doing the practices of the world and want to be body bodies and seek your friendies and, and doing all of these things to the world. Do you know what the, and, and Pat can probably tell you this uh, coming back from, um, from Nepal. Do you know one thing that they, uh, people in, in a third world country condition, you know what they hate more than anything? Is, 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 is when, when they see us and we're not up front, meaning as missionaries, and we're not up front with them, taking their condition and not being up front with them, telling them that their condition is not economical, that it's not social, it's not cultural. Their condition is spiritual. The worst thing we can do to them is to tell them, oh, if you just have the money, your life will be better. And when the church falls into this, playing games with, with the gospel, playing games with this, I think this is, this is not only uh, an answer to these people here, but, but it's a rebuke to the church. You are mistaken not knowing the scriptures. Second thing, you don't know the scriptures. Second, you don't know the power of God. And why he's saying this, notice what he says here. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. Bam! He gives them an answer that deals with the issues that they don't believe. He says, you're mistaken. You don't know the scriptures. Now, one thing they, they, they arrogantly presume all the time, and they mock uh, the Pharisees with, they says, you don't even know the scriptures. That's what you believe. All these books, the real scriptures are these five books here. And Jesus, when he says, you, you're mistaken because you don't know the scriptures. Huh? One of the things they will say that they really knew about is the scriptures. And here Jesus says, no, you don't. You don't. Number, number two, he says, you don't even know the scriptures. And in the resurrection, meaning there is a resurrection. But when they hear, you, you and I, when we hear resurrection, is oh yeah, when we die, you know, our bodies go to the tomb and all of these things. Our souls in heaven, absent from the body, present with the Lord. We know that kind of stuff. For them, resurrection is judgment. They all believe that. And it's fascinating to, as I was reading about this, I went to probably five or six different cultures, you know, from, from the days from, from the people of Israel. They just came out of Egypt and all of that. And in those days, those, those cultures around them and all of them, all of these cultures that I, that I touched, whether it be the Egyptians and any, any, any other in the land of Mesopotamia and all of them, they all believe in the resurrection. It is, it, it, it is documented that it, it, the Egyptians used to bury their, 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 uh, their people with a coin in their mouth, <laughs> saying, because you're going to get to the gate and you're going to have to pay the fee to get into eternal life. So you will have a... And, and all of these things, all of these cultures believe in the resurrection. And the, the Jewish people believe in the resurrection too. Only they saw resurrection from the standpoint of judgment because of what Daniel 12, 1 and 2 says. There will be a resurrection, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting punishment. That's why they don't like that part. So what Jesus is here saying, you don't know the scriptures. That's why you are wondering enough that way you're leading yourselves astray from the truth. Because you don't know the scriptures. Because if you knew the scriptures, you would know that the resurrection is a given fact. Because the Bible says that. And because the Bible teaches that. Oh, but then... And you don't know the scriptures. That's why you don't know of the existence of angels. And where are the angels? Well, they are in heaven. And what it says here in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels. Now, we're not going to be angels, okay? Don't let anybody tell you that we're going to be angels. We're not angels here. We don't want to be angels in heaven. But we are going to be like angels of God in heaven. Now, the issue here is marriage, okay? Because every... Every time something like this comes up, the question is immediately asked, wait, so you mean like in heaven, if there's no marriage in heaven, like here, uh, we're going to be like angels and all of that, does that mean I'm not going to know my wife? <laughs> and she's not going to know me? <laughs> 
I think it was uh, Joe Foch who used to say, of course we're going to be smarter uh, in heaven than we are right here, right now. Of course I will know you. And he, he, he says something like that. That's not what he's saying. The issue here is marriage. Now, what is the, the one purpose in the Bible for marriage? What's the one purpose? Remember we went through it? Remember? Uh, we went through the four divine institutions. Well, uh, uh, more than four. But remember the first institution? Personal responsibility. What is the second? Marriage. What is the third divine institution? Family. What is the fourth? Government. What was uh, the divine institution of marriage for? To provide what? A godly family. Why? Because a godly family is what? The base of society. Now, also, it is implied then, if marriage is for the purpose of, of, of raising up a godly family, it is the, 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 the implied that then marriage is associated immediately with what? Reproduction. Reproducing ourselves with, with, with children. Is there a need for that in heaven? No, why? Because in heaven, nobody won. Nobody dies. And so what he's saying here is he's not saying other things about Mary. And there are so many speculations. Some people said, so are we going to be like married couples in heaven? I don't know. I don't want to speculate with that. What I, I do know is that if I get to heaven and I see Lily, and Lily is more in love with me than she is with Jesus, then something is wrong there. Right? So, that I know. But what he's, he's not saying that here. What he's saying is, in the resurrection, so there will be a resurrection, then they are not gonna, there's not going to be any marriage in heaven. Why? Well, because marriage is for the purpose of procreating a family, for the, pur for the purpose of, you know, people that are dying, and then we get to have, and he says that to Adam and Eve in chapter 1 in the book of Genesis. But he says we are like angels of God in heaven. And he tops this with verse 31. Notice what he does here in verse 31. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you? Notice this. By God saying, why did he say what was spoken to you? That's also a, a rebuke for them. Have you not read what was spoken to you by God saying, verse 32, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, I want, I want you to know this. Every time he says, I am the God of, I believe that is called the genitive thing in here. The God of, that of, means I am the God who belongs to Abraham and also coming back. I am the God who belongs to Abraham and I am the God to whom Abraham belongs. And it is interesting to me that he makes the, the, those three names. He doesn't say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he says, I am the God of Abraham, comma, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Meaning, I belong to Abraham. I belong to Jacob. I belong to Isaac. Isaac belongs to me. Jacob belongs to me. And Abraham belongs to me. I like that because not only that he says Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, they are alive. He's not only saying that, but he says they are alive. And I can take this from this perspective and say they are alive because they belong to me, and they are alive because I belong to them. And if I am God and I am eternal, those that are mine will live eternally. And that's exactly what Jesus said to us in chapter 11 in the, in the Gospel of John. Isn't that what it says? I am the what? The resurrection. And he who believes in me. And so this is exactly what he's saying here. I am the God that belongs to Abraham, the God who belongs to Isaac, and the God who belongs to Jacob. God is not the God of the dead. Who wants to be a God of a bunch of dead people? It makes no sense. He says, I am not the God of dead people. God is not the God of, dead, of the dead, but of the living. Well, where we get this? We get this from <clears throat> the book of Exodus, chapter 3. You remember that, don't you? 
And when he's saying these things, the interesting thing is, by the time he says this to Moses, how long has it been since Abraham died, since Jacob have died, since Isaac have died? You remember that? A minimum of 400, 300 years since they have died. And he says, no, they are with me because they belong to me and I belong to them. Now here, here's what is really interesting in this. The, the two things that he says, well, number one, you don't understand God because you don't understand God, you don't understand heaven because you don't understand God, you don't understand heaven, you don't understand everlasting life. And you don't understand the power of God. The power of God. When they're saying that, whose wife will she be since all seven of them had it? Oh, well, it's like, do you think God is limited on that? Do you really think that God is limited in the day he created you here and the way he created you? Do you know that some of the Pharisees actually do believe that the way you die with the same cloth that you die... That's the same clue that you're coming back. And they have these foolish ideas. They, no wonder why the Sadducees make so much fun of them. Because they have these crazy ideas. One of the rabbis even asked, so what about the, the haircuts that you got? Do you mean you're going to be, you're going to be resurrected and, and you're going to have this long hair? And what about your fingernails? And all of these foolish things. And he's like saying, because you don't understand God, you don't understand eternal life. And you definitely don't understand heaven. Now watch out, because there's a book out there and a bunch of movies now about heaven and this little kid that died and went to heaven and God sent them back to say, go tell these people that they better behave. So how foolish is that? And there are books written about heaven and people don't even know squat about heaven. And what he's saying here, this is what you need to know. God is the God of the living. Verse 33, and when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Astonished at his teaching. And the, and the Gospel of Luke says, when they heard this, it says, the Sadducees dare not to ask him anything. No more. It's like he's saying, any questions? And they are slowly fading away and moving out like nada. And so the, the reason I wanted to touch on these things here is we need to really... We need to really be a church that is, uh, apart from everything that is going on in our culture nowadays, church, apart from the stuff that is happening, we don't want to be a church that is mistaken be because we don't know the scriptures. It will always be the thing that we're going to invite all of you. And, and, and there's no pressure. There's not manipulation whatsoever. That You know what you do with personal time. That's up to you between you and the Lord. But we don't want to find ourselves mistaken because we don't know the scriptures. We don't want to find ourselves mistaken because we don't understand God. We don't want to be led away by our own deception. And we don't want to be in this situation. <clears throat> Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, please, if you don't mind. As we begin to close this here. Again, anything else that I can tell you about heaven and the stuff of heaven will be pure, man, pure, pure um, uh, speculation. And I, I don't intend to do that, but I can tell you. What, what we can do here and now, because the Bible is very clear about that. So what I, what I know is that, that this attack, this antagonism, this conflict is going to increase even more and more and more. And what I, my concern as a pastor and as a brother and, and as a dad, as a husband, as a grandpa, my concern is I don't care how bad the world out there. I don't care how ugly the world out there. What I care is what I'm doing with what I have in my hands that was given to me by the grace of God, the truth of his word. What am I doing with that? Because I cer certainly don't want to be mistaken by not knowing the scriptures. This is what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you might be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. 
Stand therefore, having girded your waist with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shut your feet with the preparation of the gospel of, play, of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. That's what I know. That's what I know. A brother came to me the other day, and I really appreciated that. And he said, hey, uh, I've been reading of all the stuff they're going to do and how they're going to come after you pastors, you know, because of the same-sex marriage and all of that. And he said, are you guys doing something? I go like, yeah, we're praying. <laughs> We're praying. We're not gonna do nothing. We're not gonna do nothing else. We're not gonna hide. We're not gonna run. We're gonna continue to honor the word of God from this pulpit. Because this, this this is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. This is what the Lord is calling us to, and I appreciate all the prayers. But it also applies to you as a mom, as a dad. Because your kids are gonna grow up in this mess. You know, take it for what it is. I mean, all of us, I mean, 50 and with more accumulated wisdom, we've done our thing. We've seen it. We enjoyed it. We tried it. We're here. But it's the next generation. We're not going to shield this next generation. We're not going to put them in a little bubble and keep them away from the world. It is our God given responsibility to prepare to prepare our children so they can face the world with the truth of the word of God. For he promises, I will honor those who honor me. And there is no better way to honor God but with the truth, with the truth of his word. So that's the first one. The second one here is in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10, and this is Paul, and he's writing to the church of Corinth. The church of Corinth, they were kind of like a migraine to the apostle Paul. All of his life, they were some troublemakers. But to them, he writes some beautiful things, some amazing things. And he writes in chapter 10, Now I, Paul, verse 1, myself, I'm pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. This is the beautiful thing. Paul says, I have authority, I am an apostle, I have seen the, the resurrected Jesus, uh, Lord of heaven and earth. But here he says, with the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent, I'm bold toward you. But I beg you that when I am present, I might not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wear according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are now carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. That's going to be. The battle is in your mind. The battle for the truth is in your mind. Mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. There you go. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's what we're going to do. How do we <clears throat> cast down arguments? Oh, as uh, we are committed to the word, to the truth of the word of God. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19 says this, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. What is our hope? The Lord Jesus Christ, and he's an anchor of our soul. What I love about this passage here is the Lord Jesus' commitment. Isn't that amazing? I don't know about you, but what amazes me and what is humbling here is that this is Jesus, 100% God, omniscient, omnipotent, all the attributes of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And he takes what is given to you and to me, the word of God. 
every confrontation, he takes the word of God. What is astonishing to me, what is amazing to me, what is beautiful to me is his commitment to the scriptures and to use the scriptures to bring down any, any argument. How, in, a, in such an amazing way, everything, everything that is asked, everything, he goes back to the scripture. He quotes scripture. He, is, he has a verse. Obviously, in those days, there's, there are no verses, but he has scripture for every question, for every instance, for every situation. What a beautiful life. And what a great encouragement that you are equipped, that we are equipped, not only with the, with the word of God that is truth, but also with the Holy Spirit that is power. Combine the two. You are invincible, church. If you look at it from that perspective, combine those two. We are invincible. And I bless God that Jesus put his confidence in the word and that he's always leaning on the word of God. Because he gives me such a great confidence that as I give myself to the study of the word of God, day after day, day after day, the day is going to come when I need to say something, I need to do something. It is my hope that I will go straight to the word of God and to say, thus says the Lord. And so my commitment to the word is going to prepare me. For that, whatever comes against me and against you and my children and our families. We, equipped with the word of God, we can tear down this fortress of human viewpoint ideas, no matter how ugly they get. And I tell you, I'm telling you, not to scare you, but be ready. Because these things are going to increase and increase. And the more they gain power in Congress, in the House of Representatives, the more power they have the more they are bring, bringing out their wicked agendas. And in their agenda, number one enemy, you. We are public enemy number one for them. I'm not making these things up. If they can get rid of us, they then are going to have it their way. But I know. We know how this whole thing ends, yeah? First Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection from the dead. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So no matter what comes our way, we are always on the winning side of things. But what is our commitment? Let us never fail in this one area. Let us never find ourselves mistaken because we don't know the scriptures. Number one, let us never find ourselves in trouble because we don't know the scriptures. Secondly, because we don't know the power of God. And as long as we're committed to those things, oh no, I know my God is able and my God is with me. When I was sharing with Gloria, she kind of like, I, I could hear that she had kind of like a smile. And she said, this is weird. She says, but it's almost like, like, like there's amazing power in me that tells me, look, look, it's all going to be okay. And I go like, that's the word. That's what he says. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? But that only can be a reality for those who know the scriptures. Second, for those who know the power of God. And I know you know both. And so, church, we have work to do. Let it all be for the glory of our God. And no matter comes our way, let us occupy ourselves until he comes. And there is no better way to occupy ourselves but giving ourselves completely to the study of his word and to know that no matter what comes our way, our God is able. Amen? And so, fathers, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much. Lord, it is all by your grace. Here we are talking about your word and how we delight and how we meditate in it day and night. And how we know the power of your word to set us free, to wash us clean, to strengthen us, to guide us, to give us direction and to do all of these things. God, and we're blown away that we're just a handful of people among millions around here. And yet, you call us to know you. And we have decided that we want to give you everything 
And what I mean by that is we want to give you our lives. We want to serve you. Because having this hope of resurrection, having this hope that this is not the end, this life is not it, that is the life in your presence. Away from all this corruption and all this darkness and all this wickedness. In a place where there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering. That hope. That hope is in our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our hope. He is our living hope. And we have that. And we know that we have a place in heaven. Prepare for each one of us. We have an inheritance in heaven. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. Yet in your grace, you bless your children. Not just with things, but you bless your children with you. And you take us to this place where we're going to be in your presence forever and ever. There's no greater thing than that. Blessed be your name. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for giving us this book. Every time we read of it, oh, it penetrates our minds and our hearts. And it brings us back to the place when we can say, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Blessed be his name today and forever, for he is God. And we are his people. We are his children. Oh, how we love you. And how we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.